Yes, thank you so much for your kind of introduction. And it's my pleasure to uh, be here again next year with the talk. So uh, today I would like to talk about uh, something we did about the multi model representation. So as uh, Mark said, this is uh, uh, my uh, new favorite topics. And uh, so I made this uh, presentation a little bit informal. So I want to have more conversation about what would be the important problems from the NLP point of view uh, to uh, solve this issue. So uh, let me start with uh, some teaser. So uh, can, do anyone know what is uh, ants climbing a tree mean? I want to make a guess. I, I, I think some people may know it, but don't tell yeah. others. Yeah. yeah, so it's actually a Chinese dishes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so just from the name, you probably won't be able to make a connection. This is related to that one. But if you see the description from Wikipedia, then basically it described, uh, this is a plate uh, that has some noodle. So it looks like uh, the trunk, like a tree. And then there are some uh, mines meat. So it looks like the like ants are trying to climb in the tree. And then there's also uh, some phage there. So that's kind of maybe the tree leaves. So if you just from uh, the, you know, the usual way we do the computer vision, trying to annotate a lot of the data like this, the model probably won't be able to learn this well. But from the text description, uh, there's a hope that uh, we can connect uh, these two things together. So similarly, uh, if I want to uh, locate what is uh, paramedics, uh, so this was something that, uh, again, would be hard uh, using a traditional way, like trying to collect the training data. You need to probably uh, collect a lot of training data in order to uh, identify uh, this kind of person. And also, you know, different paramedics may wear differently, so visually they may be also different. So it would be hard uh, to have a diverse data that can uh, deal with this. So I know that now that you need to have a chat GPT in your, in your presentation. So I put a, a prompt in chat GPT. As chat GPT tell me that uh, what is a visual description of the paramedics. So this is a description uh, generated uh, from the chat GPT model. So as you can see, it's actually pretty good. So you mentioned that uh, this is a, uh, they typically will wear some uniform uh, with some uh, patch or logo. So you can see that it's actually a logo here. And also they uh, sometimes wear the jacket with a reflective stripe like this one. And then uh, there has a uh, glow, goggles, and mask, all these other things that protect them. So- um, Was this an answer to a question about what paramedics wear? Yeah, so it's actually yes. as generated from ChatGPT. Yeah, so, uh, so that means that we can actually uh, use some large language model, you know, just generate a bunch of these uh, visual description of those uh, uh, items that is uh, relatively rare. And then we can try to actually match uh, the description uh, with the thing you see in the image in context. And then that gives you a hope uh, to identify uh, this person in the image. So the thing can be a little bit more complicated. So this is like just identify the objects, but we can also try to identify the object in context. For example, uh, we want to identify the car in accident. So there are actually several cars here. Uh, there's a yellow car here, I'm sure people can see that, but there's a one car that is upside down. So apparently that is the one that we referred uh, in the text. So to learn a model to identify uh, this kind of situation, Again, that is, is something that you cannot just learn from the annotated data. And ideally, uh, this can be learned uh, from, for example, image captions or, or some other data has a rich uh, text description. And then uh, you can use the, this coherence, like there's an ambulance around, and there's a uh, you know, uh, car upside down, probably would be something that uh, has an accident, then, then you will be able to uh, uh, locate on this situation. So uh, one more example is that if you want to answer some question answer of a visual scene, like uh, is this raining outside? So if we go with a traditional way to uh, solve this problem, you probably want to identify the rain drop, right? But this is something that actually not visible uh, in the image. However, if you know the association that when people have an umbrella with them, then it's likely it is raining, then uh, you can uh, use that to answer this kind of question. So all these examples uh, kind of uh, ask for, we need to have some way to 
learn the mapping between vision and language and then map uh, these uh, two different modality in the sense space so that it gives us a hope uh, that we can use uh, some rich semantics uh, in the language data uh, to solve some uh, vision problems uh, that uh, you know uh, transitioning to the annotation but we can probably adjust using some weak supervision to, to identify those objects. So what are in the uh, picture in the middle? What do those points represent? Oh, so this is like uh, the hope that we can uh, have mapping all these uh, image and the text in the context into the same representation space. So for example- All those representations of yeah, types so this, or tokens? Yeah, or... so this is a, a token that, come, so we found the word, this is a kind of contextualized word in mapping. And then uh, this is like the image embedding. So uh, I later I will show uh, oh, I see. Yeah, okay. the method that basically at the end we can make them into the embedding space. And then this is uh, basically make to the two-dimensional space you can see there. Okay. Thanks. So I, I was confused because I thought that the 10 top fastest trucks in the world would be those 10 points oh, yeah, you were yeah, pointing yeah. to. I forgot to talk <laughs> about it. Yeah. So, so yeah. basically uh, all these uh, original yeah. points are truck and then the purple point are car. And then, uh, yeah. I will talk about more detail about this. Yeah. Okay, so then uh, it's basically following uh, the same, uh, you know, pre-training and uh, fine-tuning framework. So the hope is that uh, there are some pre-training steps that we have uh, some well-aligned objects, uh, like the basic objects. And then uh, with uh, a lot of uh, uh, noisy data, uh, hopefully uh, they are weakly supervised or even unsupervised, unannotated data, then we can align those two space well. So then later on, uh, we can identify uh, some more complicated uh, scene. So in the following talk, I will uh, basically uh, first uh, talk about some our early idea of visual bird, like how to align the vision and language together. So th this uh, has been a while, so it's around 2019, but I still want to mention some of the work because uh, that uh, give people uh, an intuition why uh, we would like to align these things. And then GLIP is a more uh, new model that we developed that trying to uh, localize uh, the objects uh, in the image and then connect that with a phrase in the text. And then uh, later on, I will talk about, uh, you know, uh, I like to think about the problem of robustness and fairness. So then I will talk about some, uh, some problems that how to extend uh, the vision language to a, a geo-inclusive uh, scenario. So uh, the intuition is that we need to have some way that we can leverage uh, the semantics uh, or, or, or also the context of the image in order to identify a certain, uh, uh, sorry, a certain visual concept. So for example, here we are asking, what is this person doing? Right? So we see uh, this is a person, uh, this is a cake. So likely this is a birthday party, right? But there's no actually birthday uh, annotation you can find uh, in, in the visual data set. So what we hope is that uh, from the text, we know that uh, if we can identify this is a cake, and we know that a cake is actually <coughs> a social birthday, then uh, <coughs> likely when you're trying to uh, solve this problem, you can see that birthday uh, would be the answer. But so you also notice that his uh, clothing doesn't match formal banking. Sorry? Would you also notice that his clothing doesn't match formal banquet? Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's a little bit. Yeah, that's a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. rather than presence. Right, right, right. And it, uh, right. So, yeah, so if it is a formal banquet, then usually there would be like another scenario, like more formal, and then people would we'll be wearing a black jacket or something. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, so then uh, you want to learn the model not only, you know, just identify the object, but also understand the situation and then leverage uh, the context in the text in order. Uh, to uh, solve these things. So the way we think we do it is that we leverage uh, the image caption data because in the image caption data, uh, the caption usually uh, has a, a more rich description of what happened. So you can easily find, uh, for example, the image like this and with a caption saying people are making kids for someone's birthday party. So uh, from uh, those caption data, you see that is association with kid and birthday. So then uh, again, if you learn like contextualized representation, then you know uh, first thing kid are associated and that can be used uh, to solve that downstream task. So that is an uh, idea that we was uh, trying uh, first time in uh, 2019. 
that uh, we basically using uh, some approach similar to the mass language model that uh, in the image data, uh, sorry, in the caption data, we were going to mess out some of the words and then trying to use the remaining words and also the image to predict what is the mess out. So for example, here, uh, we have a description of uh, several people uh, working on the site word in the rain with an umbrella. And then we mix out, randomly mess out some of the word and as a model to predict uh, those words. So the model will need to, uh, in this case, uh, for example, identify this is umbrella, right? So then you can put umbrella here. And then, but you also need to predict what is uh, on a flat, right? So in this case, a model will learn to predict uh, rain. And hopefully uh, by doing this, the model can learn such an association. So that's a kind of uh, idea uh, with uh, uh, popular in a, uh, you know, training mass language model, and then we apply this uh, in a feature language task. And then hope again is like, uh, once we train uh, this model in this way, then the model will learn uh, the contextualized representation on both the word and also the object in the image. So later on, when you fine tune on the uh, up, uh, you know, downstream application, like this is a visual question answering, the model now can identify raining and umbrella are related. So then when they uh, identify people wearing the umbrella, you know this is raining. So uh, more specifically, uh, we get uh, the text as a usual uh, token embedding put into a transformer. And from the image side, we use a visual encoder. So uh, at that time, this is uh, just a VGG network, but uh, later on, uh, this has been swapped to more uh, advanced visual uh, encoder. And then you identify those objects and put them as a visual token into the transformer. So then the model can then add correlations. <laughs> okay, and then uh, besides uh, just predict this uh, mass language uh, model loads, uh, we also in, uh, uh, try out several different other for training objectives. So for example, we find uh, as model to decide uh, this caption or that caption is more related to the image. So this loss is also very uh, useful. And this loss is actually very similar to the click uh, model that uh, later uh, open air train a, a huge model on that. So even doing these very simple things, uh, we find out the model can actually identify something interesting. So this is for us the uh, example I showed you before. So in this case, you can see that model actually put a higher attention weight between the accident and this object seven. So object seven is actually this one, the one, uh, the car that upside down. And you also uh, put uh, some weight on the object nine, uh, which is an uh, ambulance or fire truck. Yeah. And, and this is again, because uh, accident usually uh, come with a fire truck. So, so the model learned that representation of it. So uh, because uh, that association has been captured in a downstream model. So then uh, when we fine tune, uh, this model to several different tasks, and then, uh, you know, as a story you see in all these uh, training models that it gives some uh, improvement over the existing uh, approach. Okay, so uh, since that, there was a, a lot of a different model has been proposed. And uh, most of them are leveraged these uh, uh, image caption data uh, to learn uh, these uh, visual and language representation. But we, know we, but we are interested to see that if there is a way that we can actually uh, learn that representation with all the caption data. So this is actually similar to uh, unsupervised machine learning. So sorry, machine translation. So in machine translation, we know that if you have a supervised uh, alignment between two languages, uh, it's easy to train a model to align both. But if we don't have this aligned data, would there be possibility that we can just train an image model and a text model using the same a transformer and hopefully they can align by themselves. And of course, uh, we would like to do this because like, if you are working on some domain that don't have a lot of the aligned data, then you would like to use uh, that technique. And also in general, if this work, then it can be uh, augmented to the current uh, image caption data and then uh, help to improve the performance. So unfortunately, we find that this is not that easy. So it's actually not like a, uh, non-supervised machine translation because vision and language data actually are so different. And it's different in the way that, you know, people may have a, a bias that they don't mention something that is obvious. So you would not say, for example, uh, yellow banana. You, you may say green banana, but you won't say yellow banana. So, so then uh, these two uh, spaces cannot be easily aligned uh, without any supervision. 
Uh, however, the good news is uh, if we have uh, some anchor words, like some basic objects, so like 80 basic objects in the MS Combo, for example, uh, this is good enough to put these two space uh, together. So that was uh, uh, the, one of the idea that uh, we were trying that it, it might be hard for the model uh, at nowhere to learn a uh, tech and birthday are related. Because uh, in a, this is like a object detection model, you can detect this is a cake. And in the text part, you know cake and birthday are related. But to, to, if you want to align these two, we must need to uh, have some anchor, for example, to put this uh, two uh, cake uh, in the same space, and then everything will be aligned. So is, is that because uh, the arrow at the top has uh, some kind of supervision? Yeah, so because if you have some anchor, then that anchor can uh, actually help you to align these two space. Uh, let me show you the, the example that you missed. I, I was just thinking that the image there might often occur with the word birthday, and so it would pick up that correlation directly. Uh, yeah, but this one, we don't have an image caption data, right? So right. you don't have the image. It's just labeled images. So you just it's labeled images. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so in this case, we have an object detection model, so we, we can actually correlate. Uh, the cake with the word cake, yeah, and then you need to actually align this too. So, so then uh, based on this observation, we, we find a, a simple idea will work. Like if you just uh, train the same model on image and uh, uh, you know the the text data, then uh, you won't be aligned well. Like I say, so th this is with uh, the baseline that. Using the same transformer, they share the parameter, and then uh, on one hand you do this uh, usual mess language model. On the other part, you also do uh, the image version of mass language model that you hide part of the image and then predict what is the talk, uh, visual tokens there. But uh, if you add in uh, some tech invading, so uh, when you uh, put in this image together, you also uh, give a set of uh, aligned, you know, a, a set of a detected tech uh, from the object detection model. And then you also do the mass uh, language model kind of masking there. In this way, even this is a, just a very simple basic object, uh, we find that the model actually can learn, uh, align these two space well, and then you can actually uh, align some high level concept. Uh, what do you mean by align? Uh, align means that uh, the, the cake representation uh, in the space will be the same as uh, the word cake <laughs> and the image cake. And does that actually turn out to be true? Yeah, so uh, another another uh, verification is that when you plug into a downstream task, you get similar performance, means that the model will that comes up. By uh, parameter sharing, do you mean you are training those two models jointly, or do you train like iteratively? Yeah, so parameter sharing basically means that you have a one model, actually, and then uh, in some batch, you give the text data, in some batch, you give the image data. Yeah, so you alternate with the train, train on, this, uh, on the same transform. I see. Uh, and on the right side, so without adding those mask uh, task, uh, what's the original task of the right transformer? Uh, so the original one would be just like a, give an image and then predict what is the mask out in the image. Yeah, and, and this one is like uh, together with that image, I also uh, you know, in the input you augment with uh, those uh, tag that detects on the object detection. Okay, so for the mask areas, are you predicting the exact image or you like do you do it like a classification? That's a good question. So we, we do this uh predict the uh, image in baby. Yeah, so it's like a regression question. So so each image already use a visual encoder to report as an image as an embedding. So like the uh, I forgot hundred dimension factor or something. Yeah, and so here you just predict that factor. Yeah. But, but you can, I mean. Nowadays, probably you can also use text to image model to, to actually align to the image. Did you also try to mask image embeddings and try to predict? Yeah, yeah, that's what this part of doing that you mask an image. Okay, I see, I didn't see this. Okay, so let me just show you the results. So we find that uh, with this, uh, you can actually get a, a pretty good uh, alignments uh, in the way that. Uh, this is a result of the visual bird uh, uh, with uh, aligned uh, image caption data. And the base model, uh, if you just uh, train these two uh, separately, then you got uh, some significant job like this. 
but uh, if you do uh, uh, the, the, the thing I was saying, then uh, you can actually uh, get uh, something back. Yeah, and then even better is that I can actually use this uh, unsupervised data as an additional data like plugging into the model. And then you can actually get uh, the improvement over this uh, supervised uh, version. So the supervised version is the one that we did each caption. So with additional unaligned data, you can actually get that uh, 1%. Do you have the whisper the model which does not use the anchor points or the object detector basically? Oh, so that, I think that is your... Uh, this this basement. Okay. So, so they are like one, one or two percent job. So this is a result I find you on the data. Uh, I, I think I forgot to put the result there without fine tuning. So we I mean we felt pre-training. So without pre-training is something that we back closer to this one. Thank you. So uh, in experiments, uh, how much aligned image and text data do you need as anchors to? Yeah, so uh, we, we usually use the, uh, the, 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 I mean, I think this is on so you have a 3 million of uh, line caption data. Yeah. And, uh, and but you, we have a, a, a lot more the data that is uh, on the line. I mean, if there is a curve to show the performance, like how the performance changes with the amount of oh. line data. Like. Uh, I forgot if we have that in the paper, but yeah. yeah. But that, that's a good Okay, so this is uh, uh, some of the uh, earlier attempt, like uh, how to learn the vision language uh, representation. And then uh, there was a, a famous paper called CLIP that they are trying to uh, train the image classification model uh, based on this uh, image and text uh, match. So the idea is also similar like, because we have a lot of these uh, image caption data. So this can be used uh, to train a detector to detect some objects uh, that is a uh, uh, rear uh, in the object detection data set. And in the click model, uh, the, the model is basically uh, first encode the entire uh, caption uh, into a text representation. And so, so each of these will be like a factor represent uh, these uh, captions. And then on the other hand, uh, you can also encode uh, the image using an image encoder into a factor. Then basically you can take these two factor and get a cosine distance and then use that uh, to align the model, the to align is the two representation. So then they basically uh, uh, do something like this. So for each batch, uh, they will get a text representation, an image representation, and then and then do a classification test, uh, kind of uh, saying that if this uh, text uh, description or uh, caption is aligned with the image. Or not. So uh, they show that. Doing this uh, can actually achieve pretty good performance uh, in uh, identify some real objects. Uh, but the one uh, restriction we find is that, uh, you know, as an LPO, we all know that if you want to encode a sentence into an embedding, then you are going to lose a lot of information. Yeah, in fact, people find that uh, those representation is very hard to capture, for example, a dog chasing a cat versus a, ch a cat chasing a dog. So a lot of information will actually lose uh, when they train uh, such a representation. So uh, one thing we are trying to do is that uh, we just take uh, the sentence embedding that I learned with a clip and then see that if we can reconstruct uh, the original sentence using that uh, sentence embedding. And not surprisingly that we find that uh, a lot of time, uh, the model actually would not be able uh, to uh, reconstruct our original sentence. So this is basically showing uh, how exactly we did. So we basically analyze that if I take the, the clip uh, sentence in fading, and then I train another T5 model uh, to see that if I can decode uh, uh, what is in this uh, representation uh, to the original sentence. And then we fix this uh, uh, clip encoder because this is the, the original model. And then we, we will see if we can train such a uh, uh, back. And then we find that in most of the cases, uh, for the first short sentence, the model would be able to uh, reconstruct, but for a longer sentence with some composition, the model will likely miss out. So here's a, a whole table here. And, uh, and then uh, uh, the, basically the summary is that uh, when you have uh, more objects and more complicated situation, then uh, the model is unlikely to be able to recover original sentence. And then if you look at uh, the result here, 
uh, this is a uh, uh, using the clip uh, text encoder, and this is a, a new version of the clip uh, that uh, are trying to fix uh, some uh, issue that a uh, non issue. And this is a, a clip uh, with a, a stronger text encoder like Robota. So all of them uh, cannot can only kind of recover about thirty percent of the uh, text. Uh, whereas if you're using a strong text encoder like sentence bar that is specified for this kind of situation, uh, you can recover about uh, forty percent, but still not enough. Uh, like that means that sixty percent of the time you will not be able to really capture what is in the text. And just to proof of concept, we also train a T five model that you know uh, from end to end that you do trying to decode and encode, in that case, you will be able to, 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 to generate uh, the, the, so that means that if you, everything is trained into it, you'll be able to actually encode that. Here we are freezing the clip encoder, right? Only yeah. key five is tuned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we're trying to understand that just from the clip encoder, we'll be able to uh, get the information. So even on the last line, you're encoding to a fixed dimensional embedding? Uh, yes, yes. And so there's no cross attention. Yeah, so this one is no cross attention. Yeah. That's interesting that it does so well. I mean, because it's still suffering from Ray Moody's uh, complaint that yeah, the, the, that the is embedding is fixed, yeah, which is not the case if you have cross attention. Uh, I think so. I think, yeah, this, this is what I remember we take out the cross attention. Mm -hmm. I need to check. Yeah. I wonder for the clip, the loss is not defined to do this kind of task, right? But if you added the auxiliary loss that does this reconstruction, do you yeah, that that's a very good question. So in this paper, we haven't got a chance to see if we can improve that this encoder. So, but that is something that we actually want to try. Yeah, but this one is more like analysis to see that if a test encoder is powerful enough uh, to store the information that needed to. Yeah, because the, the uh, and this is one more slide I forgot to put it here. Like we find that, uh, for example, if you have a, a cat and orange cat or, or a blue cat, the model actually cannot tell blue and orange. You know, some, sometimes because that embedding already does that information. Okay, so what should we do about that? So, uh, yeah, one way is like, uh, uh, Kevin said that we can try to uh, enhance that text encoder. But another thing that we are trying to do is that we should uh, down to the object level, not, not just a sentence level. Sentence level is too raw, that uh, is, uh, you miss a lot of information. So then uh, one idea we were trying is that we want to uh, unify several different kinds of vision tests uh, into this, uh, what we call face grounding test. So face grounding test is I uh, give you an image and also a sentence. Uh, and the sentence can be pumped in different way. And then we're trying to align uh, the phrases in the sentence into uh, the objects uh, in the image. So basically grounding uh, the phrase uh, in, the, the, in the image. So why doing this uh, is interesting because uh, you can actually design your sentence in different ways. So for example, if uh, you have a traditional object detection questions, that give you image, you need to identify the object choosing from one out of these thousand labels. You can simply simply just uh, have a point say detect the object and then if this is a thousand object, right? And that's a model to uh, align uh, this uh, object name but with uh, object image. So, so this is actually a very unified framework that you can actually put on different kind of data. I will show you uh, some of the data we put in later. But basically uh, methodology wise, it's similar to clip but even in the way that a clip is in the sentence level, so you encode the sentence representation and align with the whole image. Here, uh, we align uh, the uh, contextualized word representation uh, in the prompt uh, with uh, the object detect uh, in the image. So in this way, you can get more fine grained level alignments. And then later I will show you that you can actually uh, use distance supervision to confirm many different types of data into this form. So there are a few more details here that you can see in the paper, for example, that uh, we want to align phrases, like for example, there is a blue gyre greater than just a one word. So, so then uh, as a you know, common trick that we can uh, actually uh, uh, either using the first word of the phrase uh, to do the alignment or, or try to align every word in the phrase uh, to the objects. 
Yeah, and the rest of things basically the same. So basically you have an object here, you have a face here, and then you have this alignment table and you're trying to you know, promote uh, the, the distance, uh, sorry, the similarity between uh, the, the, the alignment in the training data and the people. And one thing we find is very important is that we would need to actually add in something we call the early fusion. So we need to add in uh, the test representation and also the object representation in the early earlier layer of the transformer. So then you can uh, do better alignment. Yeah, but this is kind of a technical small trick that we find that is very useful. Okay, so next we'd like to talk about what kind of data you can put in. So uh, there are uh, natural detection data, like uh, basically uh, give you an image and then you want to uh, predict it is out of a certain category. So this is a traditional object detection uh, data. So for example, the object 365 have this uh, 365 category, and then uh, lab is, is uh, for the uh, real object detection. So they have uh, around 1,000 categories. And then the visual genome also have a, a large category. So we can actually convert all these data uh, into the way, like I said, you can do detect in certain things and then that model to uh, choose uh, what is the uh, right uh, label for that object. Uh, I have a question for grief, so for previous slides. Mm -hmm. uh, for work features, are you only use uh, the objects that appear in the frame or do you use other objects? Oh, oh you mean this one? Uh, the word features on top, the green boxes like it's on a, the right yes yeah so it depends on the test so if a test is like object detection then you would just say detect the object and then you put this a uh, thousand different category as a uh, in the prompt so you will learn like a uh, representation of each of these words and then try to align the right one with the object based on the supervised data yeah and then uh later i will show you that you can also do this with image caption so if to doing image caption or doing this with a, a localization data set then you are going to align the problem will be just uh, the caption or the phrase uh, or the description, and you are going to align the phrase in that caption uh, with the objects. Yeah. yeah, so uh, so on one hand, this type of data is uh, usually larger because it's easy to annotate. You can easily find an annotator to annotate, but they, they have a less number of uh, classes. So even this one is uh, for the real category, there's only a few thousand classes. But on the other hand, uh, this is another type of data called the bonding data. So bonding data solves a different problem. It's basically I give you uh, the image and some description, and then you need to align uh, the phrases uh, in the description uh, to the bounding box in the image. So there is uh, some uh, uh, vision uh, annotation for this. Uh, the, the good thing about this type of data is they have a lot of uh, unique phrases. So you can actually use that to detect some very real objects. But the downside is this size of the data is usually small. Yeah, because uh, annotating this kind of data is very uh, tedious. Yeah, so uh, our framework can actually bring up uh, these two different types of data together. So then uh, through uh, using uh, you know, the, the same way that give an image and a prompt and to learn the phrase bonding, uh, the model can both learn doing two jobs in object detection, but also leverage uh, the context uh, in, the image, uh, in the caption. And moreover, we can uh, use a distance supervision idea, like I said, because this type of data is small, but they are very important. So uh, one thing we can do is that we can use uh, the train model to automatically annotate uh, the image caption data. So usually in image caption data, you don't have this uh, uh, phrase level alignment uh, because uh, they just have an image and a caption. But if you run uh, the model that you already trained and to do this uh, uh, phrase bonding to try to find the phrases aligned to the image. Because most of the time, uh, the, the, the object mentioned in the caption would be actually in the image. So then uh, you can actually use that to uh, get the, uh, uh, some good quality of data. So this is actually uh, what the annotation got from our model. So the model may have learned what is uh, uh, fascinating, but the model can actually align face, uh, face in, uh, to this box. Yeah, and then again, this is based on uh, the model already be able to uh, align uh, maybe real to this box, and so you can also listen to that. Is the model also generating the bounding boxes or they are generated by a pre-trained model? 
Oh, uh, that's a good question. So the we we use in the the die head uh, model to generate those multi classes. Yeah, so that that's a, a generate from some uh, issue too. Thank you. Yeah, and then this is uh, a few other example that uh the pseudo quantum data we generate. So uh not every uh, alignment is correct. For example, this uh, line was full plastic t shirt to this one. Uh, but uh, most of the time, you can generate a pretty good bonding box because, again, this is based on the distance supervision uh, assumption that uh, the object mentioned in the captions uh, mostly align uh, with the object. Okay, so with this idea, we find that uh, the model can actually do well in detecting some real objects. So we try that in this uh, object detection in the well data set. So this data set contains several different types of uh, object detection problem. And uh, some of them are like an animal, like raccoon, is a nice open uh, label, but you also have uh, some, for example, identify the hole in the roof, and also uh, identify uh, some type of fish, uh, uh, real, uh, kind of real category, that or, or like a boxes uh, something. So the model can actually do pretty well uh, in terms of uh, uh, digital shot or few shot. So we compare uh, with the supervised baseline. Uh, so this is a diehead model that was the state of the art model at that time. So uh, the orange one is this uh, uh, diehead model that trained on uh, one example, three example, five example, example per category. And the blue one uh, is our uh, model uh, with uh, 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 this is a normal size of a transformer. And the purple one is with a large size of a transformer. So you can see that uh, for this one, even this is zero shot, you already achieved some performance closer to 10 shot of the earlier model. Yeah, and then uh, overall, uh, it is more effective uh, to align uh, this uh, vision and language concept so you can use to learn some real objects. So I want to show something interesting. So the model can actually do a sort of a prediction based on the context. For example, if you just uh, prompt the model to identify this fish, uh, you know, with uh, several different type of fish name. Uh, the model can do okay, but you will miss a lot of uh, fishes here. But if you add in some more description to the point, say a string ray is some kind of fish that is flat and wrong, and the model can actually leverage this de description in text, and then now identify those uh, steam fish better. Yeah, so this is something that uh, we find is very interesting and then uh, kind of anchor to the first uh, earlier uh, motivation that we want to get the model to learn some language description and the model to be able to actually capture a certain concept in a form and use that to identify uh, the object you want. Yeah, so we have uh, put down a demo in the hugging phase. So if you're interested in playing with this, you can uh, try out. Okay, on, on the previous slide, mm -hmm. um, you said this is learning from human instructions on the fly. Yeah. So I understand you might be following human instructions if you get this prompt, uh, but are you learning in a way that lets you recognize stingrays in future images? Uh, what do you mean by future image? Well, if you're, I, th I think of learning is something that changes the state of the system uh, in a way that lets it, that, that affects its behavior in future. Do you mean learning in that sense? Here? Oh, no. So this is actually doing video shop uh, in the inference time. So this is just inference. It's, it's just the inference time. Yeah, not, not in the learning. Yeah. And uh, what you are saying, actually, the thing we are trying to do now is to, like, to actually give those description in the learning time as well and then see if the model can do better with this type of learning. Description test. I mean, you could imagine updating something yeah, yeah. Uh, after yeah. seeing this prompt. Right. And then we actually want to do something uh, more fine grained, like, uh, for example, in the paramedic example, you can actually also localize those uh, logo or something, right? And then you can do some inference based on uh, the object you detect. If you detect this big object. Do you have a sense for how much the kind of quality of the description matters? Because I could imagine, depending on, I guess, how the the attention matrix is being computed, the fact that there's only one token in the first prompt mm -hmm. might somehow bias it towards thinking there's only one object. So it's going to put high confidence on one object. So if you replaced this like 
which is flat and round with something that's not true about stingrays necessarily, but just gives the input more tokens, would that maybe also kind of increase just the prior on the fact that there might be multiple ob objects that you should be detecting in the image? Uh, that's a very good question. So we actually tried that uh, given, given this description for the string rules. Uh, I believe we also tried uh, the first one, like you said. Okay. Yeah, and then uh, it will actually uh, do worse than this one. Okay. Yeah, so you will actually even miss the first one if you say something, you know, it's yellow or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the, the reason is because this is also kind of contextualized representation mm. you learn uh, in the text slide. So, so uh, I think from the image caption model, a uh, data, they, they have a lot of this kind of thing that you have an object and then with some description. So the model actually can take those object description into account. Yeah. So, and then you can also play with this thing. Also basically you can update any image and then provide the description and the model will try to align the phrases in the text up to the object. Yeah, and I, I tried the parametric one and it actually worked pretty well. Uh, but uh, like I said, there are some limitations. So yeah, interesting future work of this direction. Okay, so in the last part, I would like to quickly mention some of our effort on trying to uh, make model more inclusive. Yeah, because uh, this is a, a typical problem I mean, in general NLP and machine learning that uh, our data is certain, usually biased towards a certain group of data. And then uh, they might not be able to generalize well, generalize well. So for example, when we talk about weighting, uh, uh, you know, in the Western weighting, people usually wear white or black. And this is a very typical weighting thing uh, in the Western. So the model can identify this is a weighting thing and then uh, answers question related to this. But you know, uh, the weighting in different country uh, may have a different uh, color thing. So for example, this is a traditional Chinese weighting is in red. And then uh, if you think about uh, you know, waiting in uh, India, waiting in uh, uh, other country, they, they all have a different kind of things, right? So the model may not learn well uh, to identify those. So that becomes a problem. And uh, we uh, first uh, annotate a data set uh, to try to highlight uh, the problem there. So uh, the way the way we do this, uh, th this is not satisfactory, but this is uh, the policy that we can do at that point is that, uh, so this uh, visual uh, common sense reasoning data set. So we're trying to mimic uh, that visual common sense reasoning data set. And, uh, but we annotate uh, the data using the image from other countries uh, than the one that you used to annotate for. So this is always annotable, mostly uh, on the image from the movie from the Western. So we collect uh, the movie scenes uh, from Eastern Asia, Southern Asia, Africa. And then uh, we do the similar thing by taking the image and then uh, you know, find uh, the question that related to the image and then uh, annotate it. So in this way, for example, you can get uh, the question about uh, the waiting uh, in uh, South Asia or, or like this is a, a waiting uh, for, uh, for the usual Western country and also the destination. So not surprisingly, uh, we find that uh, the model uh, performed relatively well on the Western data, uh, but uh, performed much worse uh, of other uh, data you collect from, I mean, from data you collect from other region. And uh, if you look at uh, what kind of uh, a concept that the model usually get wrong, then, uh, so this is basically, we look, we take out uh, the work, uh, will come up on those questions and then use that to see uh, what kind of a question that is a big gap uh, when the model trying to answer different uh, region. So uh, for, so this is uh, obviously uh, for waiting, for festival, for religions, this is a kind, kind of a, a large category the model usually came from. And if your question is about more neutral thing like student, party, restaurant, then the model do a relatively well. Yeah. So the gap is always. Okay, so that kind of uh, uh, conclude that uh, the model might not be uh, able to, you know, deal with this uh, geodiverse common sense. So then the next question would be, uh, what can we do about this? So uh, one thing that we was trying is that you can try to train the model with more diverse uh, image and text data. And hopefully uh, by training a model on more diversified 
data, the model can do better. So uh, one idea we were trying uh, in a recent submission is that uh, if you go to Wikipedia, usually Wikipedia page also have some image and their caption. And Wikidata is more diverse in a way that people were trying to de de describe all, all these original uh, objects and the scenes, right? So, so it actually give you a better sources, a more diverse sources uh, of the uh, image and text uh, caption. So uh, that was uh, one thing that we was trying, um, but uh, we find one uh, issue is that in Wiki, you have a lot of these kind of uh, real objects. For example, this is a Chinese uh, paper cutting. And uh, with all a uh, good description, it's really hard to really align that uh, with uh, the phrases because there's only, only one or two image like this. So we find that you also need to add in uh, some object text, uh, kind of using again the earlier idea that you need to add in some low level uh, alignment tag uh, to help the model to align this image and the text later. And also we designed uh, some other loads uh, to help the model to distinguish different objects uh, in different culture. Okay, so uh, this is uh, mostly the thing I would like to share today. Uh, I want to one, mention one more thing is that uh, in, in this talk, I'm mostly talking about uh, the you know, text image classification problem. But we, but recently, uh, there's a very popular direction that people do this uh, text to image generation. So we find that those uh, model has a similar bias issue that you may generate uh, the image right, but it's not diverse. Right? So when they ask model to generate a photo of a nurse, it's mostly female nurse, and then default is mostly male, so on and so forth. So uh, the hope is the model can generate more by first uh, image uh, in terms of a different uh, dimension of like you know tone of a skin and gender and you know, other dimensions. So uh, one thing we try is uh, using the idea that uh, Daniel was also in that paper that trying to add in some description to help the model uh, generate a more diverse output. So for example, if you do a photo of a data, the model will generate mostly male data. But if you add in uh, some uh, description in the part, say all individual can be the data in respect of their gender or skin tone. And then the model uh, do response uh, in certain degree, not always right, but in certain degree to generate more that first uh, output. And so this is something that we are trying that you see that if there's a good way that we can uh, do sort of a pump engineering and then uh, leverage the model's uh, capability to leverage those language description when they uh, do the generation uh, to make the, the output more diverse. Um, is quality, the quality of the image something you'd be also interested in looking at as in perhaps the images created for white doctors are like very well defined, they're a good quality, but uh, yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, so uh, you are right. So there are actually two types of bias. One is that model don't generate a diverse one. And the other one is that exactly you say the quality for certain group is worse than the other ones. Yeah, uh, but that, that would need to solve by some other method. <laughs> but you add in more training data. Not enough, there's an automatic measure to measure to, to qualify the quality of image. Right, right. And also I should uh, mention that all these things I was talking about here is more like a uh, very basic idea that we, we only we have a one or two earlier paper there, but it's like uh, definitely have a lot of things that we should do. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think I just on time. So let me just uh, 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 summarize here. So basically in the talk, I talked about this uh, transferable multi-model representation that uh, we developed to align the text image. And uh, we're trying to see if we will be able to learn some visual concept from the language. And uh, in, another important dimension is that we want to make sure uh, those visual language representation is inclusive enough to solve all different. If you're interested in, in uh, the, the, the papers, uh, the code and the model are on my page, so you can find them there. Yeah, and thank you everyone for the attention. Questions?
I have a question about the first and second project you introduced. Uh, have you ever tried combining the self-supervised learning model uh, with um, like a visual art uh -huh. model or somehow incorporating the knowledge you learn from self-supervised learning into the uh, visual art framework? Uh, you mean like how to display the, the knowledge from a different model? Because I mean, the, uh, the self-supervised is on the different Oh, yeah. I see. So you just add another task to train the visual bird. Yeah, so it's like if you do with only train on the image captions. Yeah, so we, we have a self supervised model is like training both on image caption and also uh, the pro la language text, just a text and also just an image. Oh, I see. Yeah, and then uh, we find that although those data are not aligned well, but with a lot of unavailable data, they can still boost the performance. So you just um, like mix the batches to yeah mix the uh, batches yes exactly yeah and that was uh, inspired by uh, some of these uh, machine translation where that you, know, you, you can just use a same transformer and then to train on different language even without alignment without translated data just train using the same parameter train on the different language and the model can align well in the test time. So, um, okay, so um, most of the examples we're talking about are uh, descriptive language. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was wondering about more abstractive descriptions of the image. Um, can you talk about like how some of this would build into that or how you could adapt some ideas to that? Like for example, the, when we were doing this kind of interactive weekend, the system learns mm -hmm. from the descriptions. I can imagine that would be really helpful for more uh, abstractive uh, descriptions of the images. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I don't think we tried that. We should try. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we 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 know that the model can learn some high level concept like birthday or something, not that uh, object level description. Yes, but uh, if it is going to even more abstract, like for example, uh, I have an example earlier. Is like uh, there is a food truck on the street, and then people around there trying to buy the food, right? So if this is more like Contextualize, you need to know people are buying the food because they are closer to food chart. That's something we try in our model, it doesn't move well. But uh, that would be very interesting uh, research question to see if the model is something like that. Right, so the example of everyone cried on the food truck, a caption might be uh, uh, today's lunch rush. And you have to recognize that it's a food truck and people are there to eat and they're buying and things happen during lunch. But a lot of it can be built from these lower level descriptive concepts. Yeah. Uh, I think it's particularly interesting that the more interactive where you're like explaining the model things, you could say, you could actually, you know, generate out some of that thinking to allow the model to associate these concepts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, the ideal case would be like something you teach uh, kids, right? You're not teaching them by 10,000 examples, like really understand the concept, but describing what is the relation, all these things. Yeah, I mean, just your the examples in the very beginning of the talk where you are using um, whatever GPT model to generate these descriptions that then you were aligning to like the grounded yeah. um, images. Uh, it made me think of like, you know, these uh, reasoning tasks of the model, laid down yeah. its reasoning and applying those to images. I used to say, having the model explicitly say like, well, I see a birthday cake uh, and the person's, you know, blowing out candles and there's a bunch of plates birthday cakes or certain birthday parties, you know, like this kind of pack mm -hmm. and explicitly like aligning some of those statements and things mm -hmm. in the image, right? It might say like, well, there's candles on the cake and then it can align with the candles, like that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we, we are trying to, uh, I mean, our current project is like trying to align, uh, well, just use GPT-3 to generate a lot of visual description and align it. But I think what you say is even more interesting. <laughs> if it, you have a step-by-step -step, like, or even from WikiHow or something, you can probably align better, uh, not only just a description, but also some instruction. Yeah. Now, like a step further with the, the reasoning is um, if, the, if the model can be forced to ground its reasoning the images, parts of the image, mm -hmm. that might make it more accurate. That's so right. if the model said, you know, the birthday cake example, if the model is forced to explain it in ways where it points to other parts of the image, like this person is blowing up candles and there's candles on the cake, then that might just lead to better overall ability to understand the scene and ask questions. And the question is then how do you get 
the model to explain things that are then grounded in the image. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know how to do that. I mean, you, you probably. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that that's definitely a uh, uh, very interesting topic. Yes, yes. Yeah, and uh, now a, lot, a, a few other things that we are trying to do is like to learn the position better because you know, the, the thing I didn't talk about here is that the model do actually very bad in certain preposition. Even you say a cup under the table, the model cannot uh, recognize that because most of the image have a cup above the table on the table. And this, uh, I don't know if they are actually a cup under the table on the table in the web. Yeah. Yeah, so, so we find that there are certain things that are very obvious for us. The model doesn't learn much with it, yeah, surprisingly. Other questions? Great. Well, let's thank our speaker again.